All right. How is everybody? Welcome to another edition of the Coach's Corner on the Fitter and Faster Swim platform. I'm your host, Mike Murray. Today, we are thrilled to introduce you to the head coach of the Three Village Swim Club on East to Talk at Long Island, Mark Anderson. I've been pumped for this one for a long time, buddy. How are you? I'm doing well, Mike. How are you? I'm doing good. It's great to see you, man. I love reconnecting with you, and I've been looking forward to this one since we first talked about it. So, Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Thanks for having me. Anytime, man. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce one of my former athletes, Mark Anderson. I want to remind our viewers that if you stay to the end of the webinar today, one lucky winner will receive a free fitter and faster mask and beach towel. Now, getting into Coach Anderson. Coach Mark grew up in Poughkeepsie, New York. Mark swam for me at the Marist Swim Club, but before that, he had swum on the team for 10 years. So you were one of those instrumental Marist Swim Club families from the time you were a little guy all the way up through. Mark went on to swim all four years for Dave Alexander and Chris Brandenberger at Stony Brook University, competing all four years in the America East Division I Conference. Mark has worked at the University of Michigan's Wolverine Swim Camp, and we're going to get into your Michigan connection today. Uh, and learned a lot from coaching greats like Bob Bowman, John Urbanchek, and Mike Bottom. Mark Hill and Jim Richardson. Mark started working at the Three Village Swim Club in the fall of 2012. And since that time, Three Village Swim Club has continued to emerge as one of the best teams in the Metropolitan LSC. Mark has guided several athletes to U.S. National Championship qualifying and Olympic trial qualifying times, as well as placing one athlete on the world top 100 list. All right, Mark, you had to know that this one was coming. And I am putting you on the spot right here, right now. What is one of your favorite Mike Murray stories from back in the Marisim Club days? Now, let me preface this to our viewers that my first year coaching was your junior year of high school. Is that right? Yes, I think that's right. All right. So I was still learning. I was still learning and I was very wet behind the ears. So I'm gonna I'm gonna give you the give you the floor. Yeah, so you came in and you know, I think you inherited a pretty tough group of teenage boys. Um and I will say there was one day where we were at practice, um, going through one of the sets and you stopped us and you were like pacing, you were doing your pacing on the side of the pool deck. And you just stopped and we're like, we're, we're terrified. And you go, if you want to be competitive in this LSC, you have <laughs> got to do this correctly. Or I forget what came after that, but we were like, oh my God, <laughs> this, this guy means business. And like, I, I want to say that after that, the, the practice turned around, but I, I always will remember that, that line, if you want to be successful in this LSC, you have got to like do whatever we weren't doing <laughs> and then it you know, all kind of it all kind of came together after that it's funny that you say that because the guys who came up after you who went on to have really good swimming careers that lucas dempsey uh, mike mech there was a group there eric culver whenever they would mock me they would start out with that quote yeah <laughs> so, so i'm glad that that resonated with with yeah, you and, and everybody else uh that's so funny all right the second one do you know that i always knew you and connor were hiding underneath the bulkhead during certain repeats in practice did you know i was aware of that or did you guys think you were getting off uh we were pretty naive um <laughs> i, I want to say at the time we hoped we were getting away with it especially once we found like the little piece underneath where we could go up inside of it and find air to breathe so we didn't have to just hold our breath. Um, but yeah, it's funny now because now it's like I'm catching catching my own kids going down in the deep end, turning around early instead of getting to the other side of the pool. And it's like, God, I feel I felt bad for you, you know, many yeah. times when I'm having to deal with kids do the same stuff I did. Yeah, you guys, uh, you guys had a, a really good knack for getting underneath there. <laughs> <laughs> and what's funny, what's funny to me about that is, you know, Connor goes on to have this incredibly successful military career as a, what well, is he a para, was he a para rescue jumper? Yeah, he was a, a rescue swimmer. A rescue swimmer. So, you know, I, I have a lot of pride wrapped up in that. And uh, it's kind of funny that his underwater exploits started rather early. Yeah, exactly. 
All right. And now the other thing, Mark, that I want to break the ice with today is we're, we're talking about the coach athlete relationship. And I didn't necessarily ask you this in reference to us, but talk about the relationships you've had with your coaches as an athlete or as a young assistant coach, because you've had the opportunity to have a varied and deep group of mentors in your swimming life, beginning first and foremost with your aunt, Stephanie Kurska, who was most recently the, the team manager for USA Swimming during the Rio Olympics. So talk a little bit about the relationships that you had with your coaches. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, from, from a young age, I was involved in a lot of sports. Uh, almost through my entire high school career, I was doing baseball, swimming, and soccer. Um, so I, I, from a young age, learned to um, re respect and understand the challenges that a coach, you know, had, had to do on a daily basis. Um, and then getting into, once I started knowing I, I was going to go on and, and swim in college, um, you know, and getting more, more serious in the sport. Um, I, I just, I, I like the technical aspect of a lot of, you know, what coaches had to share. And, you know, it kind of started with you. Um, you know, Van, Larry Van Wagner was, it was a really big one. I remember, um, you know, like it was yesterday sitting around on those proprio boards, you know, him talking about fulcrums and, and all of that stuff. And, uh, you know, at the time, you know, it probably didn't seem like I was very interested because I was a teenager, but, um, it is incredible to, for me to, you know, even when I'm coaching on the pool deck, just how much information I recall from such a young age. And, um, you know, I, it's becoming more and more clear to me that those connections, you know, as from a young age really left an imprint in me. And, um, you know, then it kind of turned into realizing how, how successful my aunt was, you know, being a university of Michigan coach, um, getting to know you know, the, the coaches that she had there. And it was just becoming more and more interesting to me. So I think once I found it so interesting, um, it, it really led to, led me to to want to go on and, and kind of sp spread my knowledge of the sport and, and try to change kids' lives for the better, like, you know, the coaches that I had to, you know, swim for did for me. Absolutely. And I'm glad you brought up Coach Van Wagner. I still I have a hard time calling him Larry to this day. I just call him coach. Yeah, uh, there is such a level of respect there. But you and I are very lucky in that, in my opinion, we got to spend a long time around really one of the best coaches in the, in the history of American swimming, in my opinion. Uh, what he did in a relatively small market for over 30 years at Marist Swim Club was pretty remarkable. We talk about the connection that your family has to the University of Michigan. Larry and Jim Richardson were very, very close because he had Alicia Humphrey from Marist Swim Club, who would eventually go on to win the 400 IM at, at NCAAs in the 90s. At the same time, he had a world-ranked athlete in Steve Sheedy. He had Corey Berg, who made the national junior team, and several other USA national team members, all out of this small market in the Hudson Valley in a six-lane pool with a little diving well at the end of it. And you talked about being on the proprio benches and just learning the vocabulary of our sport at our ages. Um, you know, I got to see it from the coach side and learn all of those things. You got to benefit from it at being an athlete. We learned all of Coach Charles Sylvia's uh, four factors, the big four. And that's something that I use with my athletes to this day. And it's something that has given me so much more credibility as a coach because I understand the history of it. That was a big part of the Marisim Club program when you and I were playing a role on that team. Talk a little bit about that. What things have you taken from Marist Swim Club uh, into Three Village? So I think, like I said, my, one of my favorite things and the, and the stuff that really sticks with me is, is those stroke talks that we had. Um, I do remember sitting again on those proprio boards, uh, just going through high elbow catch, you know, supination, pronation, uh, shoulder girdle, like all, all these words and vocabulary that um, at the time I was like, you know, just overwhelmed by all of it. But now, you know, I'm, I'm using it on a daily basis. Um, and then taking that and, you know, one of my first things that I did when I took over was I built a underwater video rig, very similar to the one that we had to push up and down the pool deck at Marist. Yeah. Um, and and uh, I saw an immediate, you know, 
uh, engagement from the athletes as soon as they were able to see themselves underwater. Um, for many of them, they, they had never gotten that. Um, so just sitting with them and, and kind of going one on one, going through a slow motion of, of what their stroke looks like underwater, you could just see their eyes like widen, like, oh, my God, like that crossover is is so much worse, you know, than it feels when I'm swimming. And, I, you know, that's that's really why you do it is you, you put the two and two together you know, with what you're being told and what it actually looks like underwater. Um, so I will say that those two things were probably the most uh, significant things that I brought um, to the club that were, were, you know, big points in my life swimming at that, uh, at Marist. And, you know, again, I just think the, the intensity and, and the, the dedication to, you know, understanding that this is a sport that requires a tremendous amount of hard work with, sometimes and most of the time very little reward um, in, in the short term. And I say that because uh, I think a lot of kids go on and I've had kids come back that graduated, you know, four or four or five years ago and they come back and they say, man, you know, some of the lessons that I just, you know, kind of overlooked at the time, you know, I come back and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for the ability, um, the ability to to, to just time manage and realize what hard work is and and do all of these things, you know, while maintaining a social life and while being able to uh, just go about a, a daily life and, and keeping yourself mentally healthy is, is important also. Um, so, yeah, it's it's really those two things. And, you know, everything else has kind of been a, a modification, which has also been a lot of the, a big part of the fun also. Oh, definitely. Making something that made an impact on you into your own adaptation, I think, is so important. I think it's fair to say, Mark, in early 2000s, we were doing videotape review with Larry before a lot of teams were. And it wasn't like every other day. We did it every Saturday. Every yep. Saturday, there was a stroke talk. We reviewed video. And not only did you review video of your own swim, but he reviewed everybody's technique in front of all the teammates. So you could see where people were making changes, um, where there were deficiencies. And that was incredibly powerful at a young age, you know, to be exposed to all that. So you're taking all these lessons that you learned from Marist. You have a great career at Stony Brook. And then you go to the Three Village Swim Club. And Three Village and Marist Swim Club were very close teams. We did a lot with those coaching staffs. Barry Roffer had a huge impact on me, and I know he had a huge impact on you. But there's so much history, legacy, and tradition at Three Village. You have athletes like national teamer Tom Luxinger. You have Olympian Julia Smith. These are great tenants of a program, but they can also create a little performance anxiety because of those who came before you. So talk about how you balance a lot of the great success and the early success that you've had since you've been there with the tradition of success, how do you manage that as a coach? Uh, so I, I remember the, the whole interview process, you know, pretty vividly. And I remember, um, you know, sitting with Barry at a bar and he's like, are, are you ready? Like, I, I think you're the one, like, I just need to know, like, if you're ready to carry this on. And I looked at him and I said, you know what, I, I remember sitting um, at Lehman College, you know, at senior Mets or something like that. And I remember a few coaches very vividly. It was Dave Ferris and it was Barry Roffer just who, you know, yelling, screaming, jumping up and down on the side of the pool. Um, so I, I was excited to to have that opportunity, but first and foremost. Um, I think once it, once I actually started coaching, um, one of the biggest things that I felt um, was it was important to me was learning to manage, you know, bad swims when they happened from my athletes. Um, I remember one of the first meets as a head coach, you know, a couple bad swims and, and I had anxiety. I was like, oh, my God, this isn't working. Like, what am I doing wrong? Um, and and I, it took me some time to kind of overcome that fear of failure and, and turn it into more of a, a motivation for myself as to you're just making sure I'm, I'm reflecting on what I'm doing. Am I doing everything in my power to um, communicate what I want from my swimmers? Am I giving them the belief that they're ready to do, you know, what I'm asking them to do or whether it be at a performance or in practice? Um, so 
with, with all that success that the club has had um, since it's been formed, it, it, it was me realizing that I'm here now and I can, you know, build on that, but I can also not to be afraid of, of doing it my way and, and understanding that um, bad swims are going to happen. You know, kids are going to leave. Kids are not going to enjoy themselves. Like that's all just part of the sport, but to control the ones that are, are willing to buy in and, and, and just kind of creating your own culture based around uh, the, the kids that want to buy into what you're selling, basically. That's a perfect segue into my next question, Mark, because what I wanted to ask you is something that I'm probably most proud of you for since you started coaching. You really have developed your own unique coaching style, and it's completely predicated, in my opinion, on the relationships that you have with your athletes. Talk to me about how you how you learn to value that so much and how you use it to be more effective as a coach. Yeah, so this kind of goes back to the last my last answer was I, I had a eye opening experience and I don't know when it was. It might have been a year or two in where um, I, I was I would come into practice. I would you know put the setup on the board and I would you know go through practice you know pushing the kids and and really just you know, wanting them to hit certain goals. And, you know, some days it would happen and some days it wouldn't. Um, and, and I just kind of realized, like, these kids should be coming to practice and, and looking forward to the environment as a whole. Not, not only just looking forward to practice, but looking forward to seeing their friends, looking forward to engaging with uh, the coaching staff before practice. Um, and I think as soon as I realized that, I saw a lot of kids not only show up to practice in a better mood, but they would show up early. They'd come and they'd sit with, you know, my assistant and myself before practice. And they would, you know, we would spend 20 minutes just kind of asking them and talking to them about their day. And, um, you know, that that group would grow and grow um, day after day. And, you know, once I just realized that their their environment needs to be a safe environment, it needs to be an environment where they feel like they can come and succeed. Um, it needs to be an environment where, you know, they, they feel like they can tell me anything. And, and I and I tell them that I say, listen, if you had a bad day at school and you're not doing well, you know, you know, come talk to me. I'm not going to tell anybody, you know, unless unless it's something serious, you know, but, you know, a lot of them feel like they, they can talk to their coaches about, you know, problems they have going on more so than their parents because they're just afraid of what their parents reaction might be. So, sure. you know, once I was able to kind of just understand, you know, that I had that power to, to create this you know, environment for them to come and feel successful, it, it really changed a lot for, you know, the efforts and practice. And, and that's kind of like where the, you know, the, the change in, in what I wanted to do in practice kind of happened. I went from that old school um, yardage, grind it out, and I kind of started changing it around to, you know, what I wanted to see in practice, which was a, a lot of really high intensity, you know, a lot of repetitions of, you know, doing things correctly. And, you know, working in a lot of strength components to workouts on a daily basis and not just, uh, you know, a dry land hour and then in the pool for two hours, you know, getting getting a, an in and out. You know, uh, we have pull up bars on our pool deck. So we would do, you know, a really quick set of pull ups and they'd get right up on the block and they'd go, you know, 100 for time. And, you know, you just saw them. You just saw the mindset change like, oh, I can't do this to you know, them asking like, hey, let's let's get up on the block and let's race, you know, and, you know, them calling each other out and, you know, saying, hey, let's, you know, let's go 100 fly right now. And kind of that that um, beneficial trash talk has has been. A, I love it. A, yeah, it's been a it's been a plus that has really kind of made the big difference lately. That That's so important, Mark. And you, you touch on a lot of things that we're all, I think, trying to create within the program is how do we keep our kids excited about challenging themselves? And it sounds to me like with that variation on training that you just mentioned, that's keeping them engaged and getting them excited to want to swim fast at practice. Getting competitive at practice is something that, man, if, if you could get your team to do that on a daily basis, the, the sky is the limit, right? Right. So right. what was that aha moment where you started to combine some of the strength training with the swim training inside the same session. Talk about that. So I think a lot of it was, you know, going back again, doing doing a lot of, you know, 8,000 yard days. Um, and don't get me wrong, I, I still love a really good base in the beginning of the season, 400s, 500s on repeats. 
Um, but you know, once you get into that November, you know, approaching your, your taper time, um, you know, listening to them, I think was, was an aha moment for me. They, they were just so broken down, you know, come like Thursday, Friday of a, you know, a 60, 70,000 yard week. You know, I decided to start listening to them. I said, Hey, what do you guys want to do today? And, you know, they, they always throw out the word water polo and, (laughs) and, you know, pizza party. But I was like, all right, let's be serious. What do you guys want to do? And and they would they would come up with you know let's let's do some undulation drills. Let's do they love um, floating with a snorkel and just working on body position. And those are all things that I kind of did one day in hopes that it would um, translate, you know, and just give them a better understanding. And now it's become something that you know they look forward to doing. And and you know listening listening to them and you know because they're the ones swimming. So I have to you know I don't want to push them to a point where you know, where they break, you know, I want to get right up to that line and then, and then give them something that they want to do just to kind of keep their spirits up. And, um, you know, a lot of the time it'll be something easy. Like we'll float for 30 minutes. We'll do some, uh, flip turn drills and then I'll say, all right, now get up on the block and we're going to, we're going to finish with something that I want to do. Um, so that, that was really the aha moment was just kind of listening, listening to them and, and, you know, allowing them to kind of control a little bit of, of again, that environment that they created. Like, I, I don't want them to feel like it's ever just just me, you know, because it's it's 50 athletes in the pool that create this senior group and it's 200 athletes on the team that create this environment. I want their voices to be heard, you know, just as much as mine. Oh, absolutely. So what are some of those strategies that you use? And you talked a little bit about meeting with the kids before practice. What are some strategies that you use to help create that relationship with the athlete? So what are some things that you do during the season to make those connections? So uh, my wife is a, is a phys ed teacher. Um, her mom was a phys ed teacher, and they both have a really uh, big background in Project Adventure which is focused around team building and using using objects in everyday life to kind of accomplish a common goal. Um, so again, there'll be days where, you know, we've had three or four really tough dry lands in a, in, in a week. And, you know, Saturday morning, we'll do something as simple as, you know, a human knot where it's, you know, 10 kids, they all hold hands, they make a big knot with everything. And you know, just them laughing and, and being together and trying to accomplish something as simple as untangling themselves. You can see it just, it has a resonating effect, you know, for weeks and, and months down the road. It's, you know, there are still instances that, you know, I was like, oh, remember that one time where you had to do the somersault inside of the human knot to get out of it? And they all start laughing. And um, so it's a lot of stuff like that. A lot of team building games. Um, again, something as simple as just rewarding them with a, a ultimate frisbee and making it fun with like a, a boys versus girls or um, just something like that, where you know they, they get to they get to be kids, you know, but while still incorporating without them even knowing sometimes uh, a little bit of team building and, and just you know partnering them up with with kids that they've never had, and then you know myself going around and, and playing those games with them, and you know that, that's honestly been probably one of the more fun things that I've come to appreciate is just laughing with them and, you know, sharing in them being a kid again is, you know, as young as I am, I guess I'm not that far removed from, you know, their age. So it's, um, that, that's been a lot of fun is, is getting involved with, you know, team building activities with them, um, and just laughing and and participating with them. Sure. And what do you do, Mark, when you have some of those athletes who are a little bit more introverted or who might be a little bit more difficult to make a breakthrough in terms of developing that initial relationship? How do you how do you maintain patience? Right. We want to be patients with those types of kids. But how do you how do you make that connection? So, again, going back to, you know, my wife being a phys ed teacher, she she deals with this a lot inside of schools. And, you know, we we both come home and it's like, oh, my God, these kids, you know, some days they just, you know, you want to pull your hair out. But um, we both kind of sit and, you know, it, it was, you know, we have to find their why is is what she uses a lot. It's, you know, why don't they enjoy coming to practice? Why don't they think 
they can do, you know, a set of hundreds on one time. Like what, what is their why? And once you, once you can kind of talk to them and just find their why you, you kind of see them open up a little bit more. And, um, once they have, you know, like their aha moment, um, whether it be just, you know, moving them up an interval and, and letting them challenge them, challenge themselves in a way that, you know, makes them a little uncomfortable and then kind of just talking to them about it after practice and saying, so talk to me, like, how did you think that that set went for you? And if they kind of get a little negative about it, you, you, you tell them, well, give me, give me the positive that came out of it. You know, you swam up an interval, you challenge yourself a little bit. Yes. You missed, you know, maybe the last two of that, of that set, but now you have a, a baseline for the next time that we do it, where you can say, okay, now I made the whole set. Um, and, and, and for me, once, once I had just one of those little conversations with them, um, it's almost like a lot of these kids go in and out of practice without even, you know, they think that the coaches don't even know they exist. Um, so I've also made it a point and, you know, you may have told me once or, you know, coaches always tell me if you can just give one piece of feedback to a kid during practice, you know, sometimes that's, that's their whole day. You know, that means the most to them. And, um, you know, they might not get attention at school. You know, they might go home and have older siblings that get a lot of the attention. So I've really tried to focus more on just making my way around the pool, you know, having a short, you know, moment with every, every athlete, as far as, feedback um, again just asking them how their day went and, and kind of connecting connecting with them there and, and starting slow those kids that are a little against it at first will you know either come out of their shell a little bit or you know th they're going to be happy just being you know a, a recreational swimmer and um, and I want them to know that that's that's okay and that not every swimmer in in, in my group has to be an Olympic trial qualifier and um, just, just kind of telling them that they're just as important, you know, as again, as the top level athletes and here, having them told that you, you see them kind of shift gears and start to come out of their shell and be more comfortable around the other athletes. That, that safe space that you talk about for them to be them. And at the same time, your job is to extrapolate another level of excellence out of these human beings who have all of these different goals. So I'm glad you spoke to that because I think that that's something that a lot of coaches, especially young coaches struggle with because in our minds, you know, we're so focused sometimes on the performance aspect of it that we lose track of the, the real goal of ours should be to teach each athlete. Now this is going to sound just like Larry, to reach their fullest potential. That was right. always the goal at Marist Swim Club. That's been part of my mission statement on every club since Marist, is our goal is to help every athlete reach their fullest potential. And it doesn't necessarily mean in swimming, right? Indeed. It means in all aspects of their life. Um, Mark, in, in, your, in your opinion, how critical is it to know some of the extracurricular activities that your athletes have outside of Three Village? And uh, give us an example, maybe, of, of how you used what you know about your athletes to help them make some breakthroughs. So, so uh, you know, you know, in our school district, you know, we have a lot of really, you know, smart kids, and, and on our team in general. And finding finding their skills, maybe again, like it's it, they're going to be a really smart kid. One of my graduating seniors was the valedictorian of a graduating class of you know, two thousand kids. Um, so, you know, he might not have been, you know, my top swimmer, but just because he wasn't a top swimmer didn't mean that I, you know, isolated him and, and put him off to the side during sets. In fact, there were days where, again, getting getting creative, we would um, we would do like Pictionary on the board or like uh, Jeopardy or something like that. And I would have him help me write some of the questions and have him feel like he was being involved in the game because, you know, I, I was turning to him as someone that knew, you know, probably a lot more than I did about some certain things. And, you know, he, you could tell that he enjoyed, you know, he wasn't going to be able to add as much to the team, you know, swimming wise, but he felt that he added a lot to the game by creating some questions that, you know, stumped some kids. And then, you know, he obviously knew the answer too. So it was, it was his kind of moment to, to feel important and, sure. and to feel, to feel included um, in, a, in a sport where it's, it's very individualized sometimes and the accomplishments are very individualized at the club level. 
Um, so yeah, I, I think it's it's a lot of stuff like that, and, and finding finding the kids that are really good baseball players or soccer players. You know, when we put them. Uh, or when we do like kickball again for dryland rewarding, you know, make them a captain and, and let them kind of be a teaching role to teach them, you know, hey, you can't, uh, you know, just just let them teach the other kids about baseball, you know, tagging up and and stuff that these kids don't necessarily know, you know, putting them in a role of of being informative and, and you know, letting them not be uh, condescending. You know, that, that's another big lesson that I, I try to you know, create and weed out the condescending comments and turn it into comments and, and remarks that encourage and motivate during practice and and stuff like that. And it's again, it's it's like weeding a garden, like you'll you'll come up to something and it'll be just loaded with negativity. And, you know, if you can just start little by little taking out some of those those weeds and that negativity of comments, you know, eventually you're going to have a, a garden that is is thriving and um, you, you get rid of all the stuff that you don't want slowly. Um, it's, it's a patience of love and, um, like a lot of things are. And as soon as you can, or as soon as I learned to uh, appreciate that and know that changes aren't going to happen just overnight, it was, it was very, um, very special for me to see that kind of growth and change. I love that analogy of weeding the garden. That that's, that's profound stuff, man. That might be your quote of the day today. <laughs> I, I might. Have, I think I'm going to share that with my staff. That's great. Yeah. Um, understanding the pulse of any team is really important, and we've talked a lot about how you. Oh, we lost Mark for a second. Oh, there he is. Yep, there uh, is. We talked about how um, you know you you've used a lot of different strategies, um, but the ability for the athletes to communicate with your coaching staff is really important. Um, how did you create this atmosphere? at three village and how do you maintain that so you talked about some of the strategies that you use but how do you maintain this culture it's a, probably become an expectation for you um but what are some things that you're talking to your staff about in terms of maintaining this level of excellence uh i would say a lot of it has to do with um i think a big word is tradition with our club and, you know, we, we kind of ingrain that in them at a young age, you know, whether it be at eight and unders or um, JOs, uh, our age group staff at three villages is, is really good. And I'm really sure. lucky to have inherited such a great age group coach um, or coaches rather um, from that junior one, which is, you know, our nine, 10 year olds all the way up to when they become a senior. It's such a sequential growing experience um, and I think a lot of it is, again, tradition, but we have certain things where, you know, our coaching staff at a young age requires some of these kids to do a timed mile as, as, as a nine and 10 year old. And these kids are terrified and they all finish it. And, and the first thing the coaches go up to them and say is, hey, great job. You didn't die. Like no one, no one has ever died. And I you know, saw that on your website that the, uh, yeah. the time mile and I saw that and it said, once again, this year, no one died. Yeah. So it's it's stuff like that. And, you know, um, that kind of just leads into it, it's it becomes such an event for our team. It's it's been going on ever since uh, ever since Peter Smith came over. He kind of brought that with him. So, you know, gosh, that's been, you know, 25 years or so of him doing this mile meet. And it's you know, he's got stats that go back to the very first one. And, you know, that's that's his thing. And, and he takes such pride and um energy and applies it to that that the the kids just kind of feed off of it from a really young age and you know that kind of goes into once they start getting older they start qualifying for jos and you know the coaching staff you know makes it a goal every year to try to get is to get more kids to qualify you know for jos and imx imx is a huge meet for our team um imx scores are are i think a, a great way for age groupers to kind of you know, not not necessarily match themselves up with with other swimmers, but kind of just to watch themselves grow um, through the years. What, what getting to that meet is such a, a milestone for so many swimmers that I, I think that's the one thing that has has really uh, I've seen an impact since it's come in is that IMX score and that IMX meet. And you know, and you know, these kids they they bust they bust their butts in practice you know, right up to that last qualifying date because they want to go to IMX. And, you know, the coaching staff, when they go down there, has 
such a good time with them that it's like that just feeds that next wave is oh my god you got to go to imx you got to do this you got to make the the lancaster travel meet and it's this stuff just kind of snowballs and you know it's it's really been cool to see because you know the the kids the kids kind of take charge of it and and the coaching staff you know will kind of navigate them if they get a little bit off track during the year but these kids are have become so self-driven just to make these certain you know time standards and and meets that uh, that that's been rewarding but you know i think with that comes um you know moderation and making sure that they don't get ahead of themselves at a young age and taking it you know too seriously to the point where you know, you know, we want them to, to go on and swim in college. We don't want them to you know, work, work so hard and apply so much time to a sport that they, you know, burn themselves out or um, and get an injury that kind of prevents them from achieving their goal. So, you know, you doing things in moderation, but in a way that creates that that uh, that environment of competition, a healthy competition is has been uh, fun to watch. I, I really appreciate you talking about the IMX meet because that's something that I have long used as a motivator for our age group programs to qualify for that meet and go and compete for many of them on the biggest stage they've ever been on at a young age and understand that, hey, you know, I can go and compete against people from different states and different LSCs and I can compete at a, at a high level or now I know what I need to do to compete at a high level. It's a great introduction. And I think it's an important introduction that happens before even the zone level. Because when you and I were growing up, zones was everything as an age grouper, but you had to wait all the way until the end of the season yep. just to get a chance. And if you're in an LSC like Metropolitan, remember those zone qualifying meets, some of the fastest times all year. They were brutal. And, you, and it's like Olympic trials. Yeah. You want to be top two. And so, you know, even that process is just so hard. And IMX, hey, I might not be very good yet, but I can score 1,700 points. Mm -hmm. And I can then travel with my team, stay overnight in a hotel maybe for the first time at an event. It's so important. So I love that you're using some of those things. And I have long admired what Peter's done with that age group program from the time I started coaching at Marist Swim Club. I mean, just an incredible mastery of what he's doing and the relationship that he has with his athletes. You know, he's very uh, soft spoken, but those kids know exactly what to do yeah, when they yeah. get to the pool. And, and you are so lucky to have that as a, uh, as, as a, you're so lucky to have him and the, the family really, because along with Peter came Michael and with Michael, you, now you had, you had Kate Kennard working for you for a long time, Kate Smith now, yep. uh, who also swam for us. Um, but talk about that great staff that you have. Uh, you know, you have so many athletes who played a role in three village now as members of the coaching staff, talk about the, the families that have gone into building that program from a staff standpoint and, and how do you interact with the staff as a head coach? So the, I was one of the more, I wouldn't say intimidating, but it was the, one of the more interesting things because here's this kid that kind of was just, you know, started off coaching the little kids for a year and, you know, ends up being the head coach a year later. And, you know, I, I was obviously uh, worried, intimidating, or intimidated because I, I want to say almost everyone on our staff has either swam for three village or has coached in the past for, you know, a number of years. Um, you know, my wife, Taylor swam for it. Mike, Kate all swam for three village. You know, the, the list goes on Brandenburger who now coaches with me swam for three village and Barry back in the day. Um, so it was a lot of, you know, they, they were accustomed to the way things were done and, you know, they remember, you know, the days of, of Barry screaming on the pool deck and, um, you know, demanding excellence. And, you know, I think with that, they, they took a lot of the great that he started. And, and again, they have put their own spin on it. And, uh, you know, in talking with Barry, he's always commending, you know, the staff on, on just kind of taking what he started and running with it. And, you know, just, just keep, we just, it just keeps going up. And I think it's such, such a, an underappreciated part 
And, you know, I, I always try to, you know, make sure I just tell them like, Hey, you guys are doing a great job. Like this, obviously, you know, uh, being the head coach, it, it, I get a lot of the credit and I always make sure that I, I pass that credit along to my staff because, you know, without a, a young age group, um, young age group staff, by the time they get to seniors, you know, you, you don't have anything unless they're getting the foundations of swimming at a young age and the knowledge and the love for the sport. You know, that's the one thing that, um, Mike and Peter do exceptionally well is they create such a, a love or the athletes just have this environment of loving the sport of swimming. And, you know, they, they go on, they take it so seriously the the attendance rate for these nine to 14 year olds is like 90 to a hundred percent across the board to the point where they're like, you know, we just want a day where we don't have everyone in the pool so we can do something a little different because it's so crowded. Um, but you know, that, 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 that alone, you know, I've almost learned more from them in, in just trying to do things the way that, you know, they, they remember it being done and, and kind of taking that into effect um, has, has been uh, interesting for me because, again, I, I didn't grow up on Long Island. I don't um, remember what it used to be like, you know, d swimming for Barry because I never did. So just hearing that kind of environment the way it used to be has really inspired me to again, carry on that tradition and, and put my own little spin on it. But um, I, I heard a good quote one day. It was like, I, if I'm the, if I'm the author, you know, I want them to paint the picture. Like I want them to run with it. You know, I'm, I'm supplying the vision for the club, but I don't want to micromanage and I don't micromanage my staff to the point where I'm, I feel like I'm the coach for every group. You know, I, I give very, you know, broad goals for the year. And I say, you guys are more than qualified, you know, go and run with it. And if you need help or, or have a question along the way, like, you know, let, let's get together and let's, let's find a solution to it. But I, I've always been a big advocate for, you know, letting them have that creative freedom without feeling like, oh, Mark's watching, like, let's make sure he, or let's make sure we do things this way. You know, I, I, I often take stuff that the younger groups do and I, I do it with my senior group because I, I enjoy it and. Um, I think that back and forth between the coaches is good, that sharing of ideas, you know, that getting together, you know, we all just kind of hang out after practice while the kids are getting dressed to leave the pool and we, you know, toy, throw around some ideas and, um, you know, whether it be equipment that we want to try out or, or make, you know, I've made equipment with, with Mike over the years that have been pretty interesting and, and useful for the club. And, you know, I, I just think that that communication with your staff in a way that, you know, it inspires confidence in self is, is really important. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm glad you talked about that because, you know, when I was working for Larry at Marist Swim Club and he would travel with me to the meets, <clears throat> especially in the summertime, I get to have dinner every night at a senior Mets with Dave Ferris, John Collins, Barry Roffer, John Pisano. And what I learned just in those dinner conversations about how to manage a staff, you know, who's doing what as part of your staff is so incredibly insightful and important. Uh, and Barry talked very passionately about that. And in fact, I remember him calling me and asking me if, if I thought you were ready to be a head coach at that age. Absolutely. Leadership, quiet leadership. And yeah. so yeah. I, I think, you know, having the ability for, of your staff to feel like, they have the freedom to do whatever they need to do is so important. And that's something that, you know, I, I learned from Larry. I mean, I remember finishing, I was the college assistant. I remember finishing my first college workout and he said, all right, Mike, what are you guys doing today? I, I was like, you're not staying with me for the club. He's like, no, <laughs> this is your, this is your team run with it. I had no idea. He just, day one, you're the head coach. Yeah. And and I think what you do is you kind of let those coaches be the head coaches of their groups. And yeah. as long as everybody's moving in the same direction, that's something that that makes it work at Three Village. Yep. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to skip ahead to a question because it, it has a lot to do with that. And you said, how do you handle working with coaches on your staff who may be older and more experienced? And, and talk about how your relationship with Peter has grown over the years, because he's kind of a legend in Metro LSC for what he's done with age groupers. Yeah. 
Uh, and that was, you know, again, getting back to kind of when I took over, that was one of my fears. And, and one of the questions that the, the board had asked me during my interview is saying, you know, you're only, God, what was I? I was 20, 22 years old when, you know, I interviewed and, you know, I, I didn't know anything about handling a group of 200 swimmers, letting alone, you know, leading a, a staff that was, uh, for the most part, much older than me, had been had been at the club for a long time and probably felt like they should have been considered. So I had to go in and, and make sure that I made it known that I'm not here to to change anything. I'm just here to take what's already here and, and bring it to another level w while keeping some sort of that sense of family, um, you know, was was important to me. And you know, there were there were a, there was a little time, you know, of adaption, you know, between you know myself and some of the older coaches, and you know, I think some you know were a little uh, nervous about the decision, you know, to hire me. Um, and I will say that over the years, you know, it was maybe two or three years in, you know, we had you know already we had won, you know, our travel meet in December as a team, which which was a, a huge deal, and and one of my uh, prouder moments early on was winning that as a team and, and getting the jump in the pool. And, um, you know, I think once that kind of happened, you know, they started to say, okay, like this, this kid's young, but he's doing things and, and the kids are buying in and, you know, the, the club is, is going in the right direction. We're not, we're not showing up to meets and, and belly flopping into the pool and, and taking L's all over the place. Um, so I think once, once I proved myself, you know, I think they started to open their eyes and, and that's when I really saw a, a really good connection. I mean, coach, coach Peter, Peter, Peter and myself now, um, you know, we're, we're on the pool deck and we're sharing ideas and he's asking for advice on some things and, you know, asking, you know, how to get through to some kids, you know, just because, you know, um, he doesn't always have the answer. And now he's comfortable with approaching me and, and just kind of talking. And, and that was always my biggest hope was that I could have someone like him on my staff and use him as an asset instead of having him always kind of looking over at me and saying, you know, who, who's this little kid that kind of came to, you know, technically his team that he's been on for so long and has done such great things with age groupers in the past. Um, but again, one, once, once I kind of, you know, made, um, you know, made made my mark and, and kind of took what I wanted to do with the team and started executing it. Um, I think they all kind of were like, all right, let's let's get behind this kid and, you know, let's let's keep this going and, and let's see what you know, let's see what just happens. And so far it's it's been successful. And, you know, again, I give I give them, you know, as much credit as I can, because without them, this this club is certainly not what it is today. Absolutely. And, and you you have really instilled, I think, with the staff, this sense of three villages, a fun place to work. And I think that that's so incredibly important. And the success speaks for itself, Mark. One of your best athletes, uh, uh, Olympic trials qualifier, heading to Ohio State. You and her, I, I've noticed the tradition on social media. The last day of a meet, she will do a ceremonial belly flop. Yeah. Talk about that. Talk about how that started. So I think that was probably after – Again, probably after one of our Lancaster meets, you know, early on, um, I, I, I want to say it started as a bet where it was like, if you win your, you know, it's always like the 200 back is on the last day. And if, if you win the 200 back, you know, um, you, you have to belly flop or, or she made the better, you know, I forget what it was, but um, it started with, with that. And then, you know, at the end of every meet after her last swim, that's, that's like her thing to do. And we make sure that we, we catch it on film. So you know, that we can look back and, and look at how, you know, brutally painful some of these belly flops are. But again, I think that 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 goes to, you know, just tradition and, and these kids learn tradition from a, a young age and they're very, you know, swimmers are creatures of habit. And, you know, they, they go through life waking up at five o'clock in the morning and, and and doing all these things over and over and over again. So when it comes to something as silly as a belly flop, you know, she almost um, I think I think there was one meet where she was getting dressed and she was getting ready to leave and she she dropped her stuff and she turned around and she's like I almost forgot to do the belly flop, and she would she ran back over and you know put her stuff down and then just and then did it so um, yeah it's it was it was kind of just a, a spur of the moment thing that's now kind of a, a ceremonial uh, ceremonial activity after every big meet that she does. 
One of the things that Three Village is known for over the years was, uh, you know, how much the coaching staff believed in the athletes. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm very close with Tom Luxinger. I have been since I had him. I coached him on the zone team as a, as a young athlete coming up through TVSC. He said the thing that separated Barry from a lot of the coaches that he had in his career, and he's now been retired for seven or eight years. Barry believed in him like no one else did. Mm -hmm. And I think that the coaching staff at Three Village has kind of always had that. Can you talk about how you instill that idea that you, no matter what, no matter how your athletes feel, you believe in what they're capable of doing? Yeah, so that kind of gets back to, you know, just how I how I try to create a practice is – I want I want them to do things at intensity for a, a very long period of time. Um, I, I kind of came to the assumption that I want to be entertained during practice as much as they want to be entertained. And for me, having them do you know a lot of really long sets, you know, wasn't wasn't something that interested me, and it wasn't something that interested them. Um, you know, we kind of adapted a little bit of like a USRPT. Uh, cycle in, in one of our micro cycles where it was just a lot of repeats at a goal time. Um, and, and they're getting to a point where, you know, they, they just, they're like tapping out and I go over to them and I, and I just, I'm straight with them. I say, listen, you got to find a way to dig down deep. You got to, you got to find a way for me and you got to get up. And so I'll put them up on the block and I'll, and I'll challenge them. I'll go right up to their face and say, listen, you got to give me I don't know, a, a 22, nine 50 free right now off the block. And they're like, they're, they're doubting me. And, and I'm saying, just get on the block. Here's a cap. I want you to go. And, you know, I put the kids on either side of the lane. They're all cheering them on and, you know, the, they end up doing it. And, you know, I kind of go over after and I said, so, so you could do that, but how come you said you couldn't do it during practice or you couldn't, couldn't make the set during practice. And, you know, whatever their answer is, I said, I, it doesn't really matter to me. Right. Like what matters to me is you realize something, whether you subconsciously thought it or not, you, you dug down when the moment was right. And, and you finding that moment in practice when you can't physically do it, creating that that sense of adrenaline or that that drive that, you know, so many of our athletes learn to harness like at a big meet, they get up on the block and they just have this surge of adrenaline. Finding that and creating that atmosphere in their own head during practice is, is something that I try to do. And that's just, you know, um, again, me just having them get up on the block or just telling them to do something when they just physically can't do it, you know, telling, listen, and I joke with them all the time. I'm like, have I ever steered you wrong? Have I ever like told you you couldn't do something and then you went on and did it? And they're like, yeah, I guess you're right. <laughs> so, so, and, and you know, that, and that's, that's, that, that's again, just the most important or most rewarding thing for me is, is seeing them just start to trust in me that I almost know, I know better than they do when they're tapped out and, and learning, learning what their limit is. Like, you know, just because they had a bad day, their limit might be a little bit less than what they think, but, there's so much they have so much more ability than they give themselves credit for and that's you know something i tell them a lot i said you guys don't give yourselves enough credit for being you know phenomenal athletes like forget about other sports and what they do like you guys are doing a sport that goes you know oftentimes under recognized you know you guys don't get the front page of the newspapers except for every other you know every four years when the olympics comes around but what you guys are doing is so incredible and the demands so much of the human body that you guys need to learn to appreciate that. And once all that kind of sinks in, um, th then that's when that, that per personality and that attitude and that um, drive and practice really starts to come out. No doubt about it. <clears throat> and I, I remember listening to Brian Brown talk about that one time. I, when you were swimming, Leah Neal and Annie Zhu were killing it at Agua. So as a young coach, I made friends with Brian very quickly and I would listen to him and we would talk a lot. And he was talking to Annie after a particularly bad swim. And he said essentially what you just said, listen, think of all the things that you do 
this is a meet in the middle of December. What does this really mean in the context of how hard you work? Mm -hmm. And I think that was a super important lesson for her to learn at, at that age and for Leah. Leah was right there. And those two were so resilient and so strong. And they had this mindset because of that type of environment that you're talking about right now, challenging the athletes to push those limits, learning from it. And then at the same time, at the end of the day saying, oh yeah, by the way, what you do, most people can't even come close to doing. Yeah. And, and that lesson is so incredibly important. Um, a lot of the relationships that we have as, from, as coaches with our athletes, a lot of it depends on the trust from their parents. So how do you engage the parents at Three Village to trust the program, support the vision, and give you the room to work with their athletes in order to get better and continue the developmental process? So it, it's it's been it's been beneficial because you know as a, a board run team you know we rely heavily on our parents to help with running meets. Um, a lot of that again leads into them helping with with stuff that we have going on internally, like time trials, um, our mile meet, um, rookie meets for our really really uh, young and uh, newcomer swimmers, um, and you know I think what we what i learned early on was having a parent meeting kind of setting guidelines um expectations for the team early on and having their coach of you know whatever group their kid was in at that time kind of um express their their goals for the group you know it, it kind of got through to them a little bit more and um then they kind of saw as their kid progressed how the goals for that group kind of changed and you know, after like the first two or three parent meetings, you know, they they kind of got the vision um, and, you know, just the the coaching staff and, you know, letting letting parents watch watch practices. You know, you see how much the coaches care and how much they engage with the kids. And, um, you know, I, I've I've always thought that having parents not watch practice was better. But I almost think that, you know, them watching makes the coaches better too because they have more eyes on them and it kind of holds them accountable to make sure that um you know they're they're being uh effective and and making sure that they're they're doing things at a standard that makes the parents feel like their kid is again in that safe environment um down in the pool area so uh, I, I think that that's really been you know the biggest thing is just having that team atmosphere of you know we're all in this together you know, we're all on this team together trying for one thing. And it's my, my goal has always been to just have the kids go on and swim in college, enjoy the sport enough, whatever level you, you go on and swim at D one, two or three, it doesn't matter. Um, but just love the sport enough to, to go on and, and continue swimming and, and put up with all of the hard times. And, you know, the, the parents, you know, bringing them to practice and, and kind of forcing them every once in a while over the years, I've, it's been a lot less. I've had to really, I have had to I've go into so-and-so's room and drag them out of bed. It's, you know, they're waking me up to take them to practice. And, um, you know, the parents play a big role in it also. And um, the coaching staff is really just an extension of it in my thought, you know, the they have a huge impact on these kids when they show up for practice. And, you know, the, it, it, it really translates well when, when the parents, the coaches, and the swimmers are all on the same page together. And um, that's that's just got to start from a really early phase in the season. And just um, as soon as they start swimming like this, as soon as we get, you know, tryouts are over, we have these newcomers, you know, we put down the, the expectations and, you know, how often they swim. And, you know, you see a lot of people's eyes light up you know, because they think this is like a, a rec summer league or something like that. And, um, you know, it, we make it very, you know, black and white that we're a competitive swim team. We're here to grow your kids into, you know, fine young adults down the road. And this is kind of the journey that they're going to go on. And um, we, we look to the parents to donate a lot of their time. And, you know, it's it definitely uh, it is rewarding when when they do step up and and help kind of keep the team moving in the right direction. Anytime I've taken over a team, the first thing that I've done is open up practice. 
And I think it's incredibly important. And now with the new USA swimming rules, all practices have to be open. Um, but one of the things that I learned very early on at Marist was I got so much more buy-in from the parents when they could see how hard our staff was working. You know, back in those days, it was Henry Hudson, myself, and Linda. And Henry and I were running up and down the deck. And when the younger parents saw that, they couldn't wait for their kids to get into, you know, the next level. And so I've taken that philosophy to all the teams and it's so important, you know, if a parent sees a coach super engaged working with athletes, even if it's not their athlete, and they know that down the line, they're going to get that same type of coaching. It just builds into your, just builds another level of value to your team, right? So engaging those parents is super important. We've done things like, invite parents to our aerobic test sets and our lactate sets. We, play, we blast ACDC. The kids go nuts. They know when they hear Hell's Bells coming on, we're doing some kind of sprint set. And that was lessons that I learned early back in the day with you guys. You know, we used to do that stuff all the time. And it became really, really fun. And it's, it's such an important aspect of developing your team. So... Let me ask you this. When you follow somebody like Barry and all of the things that Barry brought to Three Village, do you stay connected with Barry? And I will tell you that I know for a fact that he is super proud of you and is following what you're doing there. What are some of the things that you talk about with Barry to keep that connection alive and to keep those values and tradition of success at Three Village moving forward? Uh, so he and I keep in, in very close contact. Um, you know, I, I, he texts me often um, when we have meets. Uh, you know, when he comes up here for the summer, we get together for dinner. Um, and, you know, he's always asking about how everyone else is doing, how, you know, how Peter and Mike are doing and uh, how Emily is doing and all, all of these coaches. And then the, my favorite is uh, he'll text me the night before either senior Mets, like Relay Carnival, Lancaster meet, like the night before saying, hey, good luck, go get them. Um, and then any of those meets where we win it, you know, I'll text him after the meet and say, hey, kids swam great. Like we ended up winning the meet. And almost by the time I finish hitting send, I get the phone call from Barry. It's like he's just like has this sixth sense of of this connection. Um, and, and if anybody knows Barry, he talks a mile a minute. He's, he's very, you know, loud in your ear and, and energetic all the time. It's incredible. Um, but, yeah, I, I think just learning and, and learning what his uh, focuses were when he was trying to, you know, when he started this thing way back when, like what, what were his goals? And, and those are some of the things that I enjoy talking to him about, like what, you know, what was it like having someone like a, a Tommy on the team? And, you know, what was that relationship like at the start versus the beginning? And, and like, what were the the growing pains with the team as as it got more and more successful? Just to kind of, you know, gauge it again and, and learn to more importantly moderate, you know, my emotions, you know, getting not getting caught up in in being uh, or, or failing. Um, you know, I think that the tough thing is every every year you lose a group of swimmers that go off and swim in college and you always think to yourself, God, this is going to be a really tough group of kids to replace. And and it's never failed the next year. Those that next group of graduating seniors steps up, you know, they they take control. They they kind of put the team under their wing. And and then it's like you're saying the same thing again. And the, at the end of the next year, it's like, man, this group really kind of came into their own and became leaders and this is going to be a really hard group to replace. And then that next group, and it's, it, that's, that's been just a lot of fun to watch is, you know, from when they come to my group uh, around 13 or 14 years old to when they graduate that growth and that maturity. And, you know, there is a little bit of, you know, smacking it out of them, so to speak. And, you know, kind of saying, Hey, like you, you gotta, you gotta do things this way and, and just make sure that you're being a, a teammate first and foremost and, and being a better person. And, um, you know, I, I tell them all the time, I say, my goal is to make you guys better people by the time you go off to college. You know, the, the swimming is extra. And if you come and you work hard and, you know, you work with the with the coaches and do things the way you're supposed to do, like the swimming will take care of itself. But more importantly, I want you to learn uh, values, you know, 
that that I learned from, you know, mistakes that I've made and and passing that stuff down to them. And, um, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see how many of them want to become swim coaches down the road. And we'll say, God, and now I know why you were always so mad at me. Like, <laughs> Like I like like for like for you, I'm like God. I was such I was such a pain to Mike. I feel bad. For Huge jumps in breaststroke your senior year, and then you went into college and all of a sudden exploded. Yeah. And that's the goal, right? That's what we're trying to set our kids up for. I yeah. I talk to my staff about that all the time. You know, sometimes we'll have philosophic discussions about the way we're training. And I one of the things that I want to always talk to my staff about is look at our job is to get them to be as fast as they can but to also leave the window open for when they go to college. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, the worst thing that we can do is get them to a point where they're done with it. And then they get to college by the end of freshman year, they, they retire. Right. And so are you talking to your athletes about that Mark? Like, okay, this senior class, you know, we thought that, man, we were going to have to really rebuild after this. And you guys stepped up on, stepped up to the plate and just ran with it. And are you are you giving them that recognition? Yeah, yeah. And and, and every year when when that group leaves, you know, I, you know, so like right now, I'm I'm kind of having that discussion, you know, through throughout practice a little bit. Like that next group is, um, you can see that they're hungry and and they want to be, you know, what they want to be better than the group leaving. And and you know, you can see it in practice. Um, you know, my juniors and sophomores in high school are are racing and and wanting to beat the kids that are going off to college and yeah. kind of it, it, it's, it's, it goes full circle cause they light the fire under their butt and you know, the, the graduating seniors give them something to shoot for. And um, you know, like I said, it just, it just kind of goes around and it, it handles itself. And, you know, I'm constantly just kind of going around and saying, Hey, um, you know, what are we going to do different? You know, what, what is something that you want to see different as far as atmosphere um, morale or, um, just whatever it is, when you guys become, you know, the unofficial senior class of, of three village, like you guys have the power to, to make that year as great or as, um, you know, not great as, as possible as you want, you know, you guys, you guys are in control here and uh, I'm just kind of here to, to guide you a little bit and, and give you the tools that, that you need to, to go on and do what you want to do. Um, but yeah, it's, again it's it's been cool to kind of watch the machine so to speak just kind of build itself and and just run itself and um in a way i think i'm i'm really lucky um there have been some you know hurdles and obstacles and you know with with every team there's a little bit of growing pains and you, you get a lot of talent in one spot and it, it can get a little competitive to a point where it's you know not good competition but um you you also learn as you go, how to deal with that and, and, and manage and, and catch things early. And it all goes back to just doing as much team building stuff as you can early on in that season to kind of set the foundation for getting along with each other. Um, you know, like I said, mixing up partners during dry land is something that I just recently started doing because you, you, they partner up with the same kids over and over again. Um, so just, just different, different ways to introduce them to different people on the team you know, make them swim with someone else in the lane and just kind of keep creating that, that new friendship in and out of every day is, is, is important. Definitely. Mark, you are a relatively still young coach in an LSC where there are Titans all around you. So you are in an LSC where you are on the pool deck with some legendary coaches. What have you learned from that environment? So, I, I mean, I was thinking about it, and, and one of my favorite things is as I started having swimmers qualify for U.S. Open, um, you know, nationals, junior nationals, all of it, and, and just being able to travel, um, one, of the, one of my favorite things to do is just kind of stand next to coaches that I recognize as being really successful coaches and just listen to how they engage with their athletes without, without me kind of making myself known to them that I'm standing there. I'll just kind of stand there and listen to, to what they say and how they phrase it and, and how they connect. And, you know, at a certain point, I realized I'm like, wow, so they're really saying a lot of the same stuff that I'm saying to them. And that, that kind of helped me feel a little bit better almost about what I was doing and gave me more reassurance that what I was doing was, 
you know, um, what other successful coaches are doing, just being a young coach and having, you know, such a, a, a big picture of what I wanted to create and not necessarily the, the guidance to get there. I think just learning and, and standing next to, again, some of these coaches in the Metro LSC at, at meets like senior Mets um, going from, you know, just a, a young kid that took over three village to now, you know, them coming over and saying, hi, like your kids are swimming great. And, you know, just kind of talking to me about things that I've been doing with them and, and how I've been, um, you know, working my practices and stuff like that has um, been humbling, you know, to say the least. And, you know, um, Team Suffolk is, is one that I know you've mentioned before. And, and John, John has been, uh, John and Frank, you know, have been great to me ever since I took over, you know, and have been, um, you know, mentors to me. They were, they were always looking out for me, asking if, if they could ever help. Um, but, you know, to, to, to get compliments from, from coaches that have been around for 30, 40 years, you know, when I'm so relatively new it has been, you know, like I said, really humbling and, and special for me. And, you know, obviously when, when you reach out and, and, you know, tell me, you know, how, how proud and stuff like that, it's like, that's what I tell my swimmers. I said, you want to, you want to hear your coach say that you're proud of them it is, you know, I could say like, Hey, great race, great, this, great, that, but you know, when I go up to a kid and I tell him like, Hey, like the way you attack that race, like I'm proud to be your coach. And and those are the moments that um, had always affected me as a swimmer, you know, more so than, than any other good swim, any other, you know, medal or whatever I won. It was always having a coach tell me that they were proud or they were, you know, happy for me that I reached a goal. And, and that's again, now what I'm passing on to my swimmers and I'm making sure that, you know, they're, they're, hard work and, and stuff is not going unnoticed ever. Oh, definitely, Mark. And I think, you know, you hit the nail on the head when you said, now that I'm going to these big meets and I'm standing next to these coaches and they're saying the same thing that I'm saying, that was an aha moment for me at your age going through that same process. And then I thought to myself, like an athlete thinks of themselves when they swim up at that first big meet and they have that wonderful time. I, I, I can, play here i belong here and that can change your whole program just knowing what your athletes are capable of doing right you know right. I, I i think so much is made of you know people being afraid to tell their athletes you know everybody wants to be an olympian but let's let's pull the reins on that no if you want to be an olympian let's like i will walk with you right, right. we're going to do this together and if a kid can buy into that then the sky's the limit. It doesn't have to be the Olympic games, but you can be Olympic every single day in the pursuit of your own goals. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that I think is so important is recognizing how much that phrase, I'm proud to be your coach resonates with these athletes. And um, the effort and the attitude to me are the two most important things, attitude and effort. If you're having a great attitude, you're probably helping everybody else on our team. And if your effort is 100%, you're going to you're going to do great things, you know, and uh, it was it was really fun on Long Island to work with some kids who maybe didn't know that these things were possible and then have these explosions. Right. And so I think we, we take these opportunities and then we put it back into the program at the age group level. And we establish that relationship like you have and things just start, as you said, to roll like a machine. And, and that's what I see happening at Three Village and it's super exciting. I got some quick fire questions for you. You ready? Let's go. All right. Yankees winning the World Series this year if it happens. Yes. I think so too. Michigan beating Ohio State this year? Oh God, um, I have to go now. I don't think so either, man. I asked her band check and he said, of course, but that was coming from an emotional place. I'm not sure. I'm not sure they're ready yet. I have to be realistic with that one. Unfortunately, college football season happening. No. Um, yes. You think so? Yeah. I, I don't, I won't say when, but I think it'll happen. Are we all back in the pool and over COVID by the spring of 2021? Yes. I think so too. And that's the direction I think we all need to walk. Yep. You know, 
Mark, I'm super proud of you. I am super proud to be your coach. And uh, I look forward to watching Three Village continue to do a great job. And I know that they will. And I'm so thankful that I had you on. And please say hello to your entire family. I keep up with your mom a little bit. Uh, but please say hi to everybody. I will. And uh, Mike, I appreciate everything that you've obviously done for me in my career. And uh, know that you know, you, you've played a huge part in, in wanting me to become a swim coach and, and taking stuff that you taught me you know, years ago, God, it's hard to believe it's 12, 12 years ago, but, um, yeah, I, 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 like I said, I think for you, you know, that's, that's your big goal. And, and I just want to make sure that it goes noticed that, you know, you, you meant a lot for me, or you let me meant a lot to me growing up and, and shaped a lot of, you know, who I am today, as far as a swim coach. So thank you. Well, I appreciate it, man. I really do. And I look forward to seeing you today's winner of the fitter and faster mask and towel is going to be Adrian Wright. So congratulations. We'll make sure that we get you an email and you'll have all the details on that. Guys, thanks a lot for tuning into Coach's Corner. Mark, all the best. I hope to talk to you soon. Take care and thanks for watching, everybody. Appreciate it. Thanks, Mike.